how how would your life have been different if you didn't go to prison? I was always doomed for prison. Really? It was either gonna get me now or get me later. I'm very happy it happened when it happened. Very fucking happy it happened when it happened. They were either gonna get me that time or they were gonna get me in the next city. For something worse? For something worse or something. Who knows? The worst thing you could let a fucking cocaine junkie think is that he could get away with things. Especially with a weapon. I would have been a different person. Everybody changes once you get away with something like that. You got a certain fucking air to you. So I'm very happy that happened when it happened. It shattered my life for a while, but... I don't know how I did it. I put it back together. Now I respect that side of it. You know what I'm saying? Right. I, I just meant more along the lines of, like, the way you were with, like, the the, the drugs and, and, and robbing. Like, if you had come to Hollywood at, like, let's say, 20, no. 24. No. I would have never made it. I went to that weed store the other day up here, and I seen them do something very fucking weird. Okay. I seen them at 10, 15 in the morning go and empty, the, fill up their ATM bag. But they basically went out there with a fucking shopping bag filled with money. Whew. And they filled the ATM machine right in front of me. I could either sell that information or I could take some guy to kick in the door and I'm there with you with a walkie-talkie, a piece in your ear, guiding you through the whole thing. And you'd have to do it right, but you're going to walk out of there with some loot. But you still got to get the owner to take them to the safe because they got cash in there. They don't report. They don't put in the bank. They put the credit card receipts in the bank, and they hold on to that cash, and that's how they rotate their reefer. So if you go there or somewhere close to there, there's a safe with 200 large in it somewhere. And that's a Nike's weed store. So they got loot. This is how my eyes were 25 years ago. It sounds like they're still that way, though. Well, like, you still notice no, it, but you just don't I do it? No, I still notice it. I still notice all the mistakes. If I go in there one more time at 10.15, and I see them doing that at 10.15, they're doomed. <laughs> they're doomed. What are you going to do? 25 years ago? No, not now. Oh, okay. 25 years ago, they're doomed. I'd figure out how to be in there at 10.15. But the problem is they have your ID, so you couldn't do it. I'd have to sell the information to somebody who was liable. Somebody I knew that would go in there and do the fucking thing clean. And the only way you could do it, just like I told you today, is go in there, you know, pull them all in the back, and explain to them what you want, and right away shoot somebody in the kneecap. <laughs> let them go down, let them yell and shit, take the owner right to the back. you got a guy covering everybody, and he opens up the safe and gives it to you. You give him back 10 grand, tell him you love him. That you'll see him again and run the fuck out of there. You take that car and you fly the other fucking direction on uh, cold water and you pray for the best. And you got both fucking roads right there. You can hit the 170 or the 100. That's somewhere, menacing. I'm going to see you later. Somewhere, that guy's going to freak out. Somewhere along the line, you'd have to have a switch car and break up. Because that to be the three or four of us. Now, it's not money to fucking retire in the Cayman Islands and buy a hotel, no. But when you're a street piece of shit, 50000 is a lot of loot for fucking 15 minutes worth. Plus a jar of reefer. Because <laughs> you know I'm taking two or three jars of reefer with me. But that's how loose they are, Lee. They're that loose. I saw it. I And I think I know the answer, but you never get... Tempted, like if, no. if like not even like I'm, not, I'm okay. I'm, like no. that's probably a bad example. Not I'm not saying rob a store, but like let's say you were at CVS, right? And their deposit bag was on the counter, and there was no cashiers. No, no. There's just cameras everywhere today. Like, they either gonna find me in a week, or they're gonna find me in six months. But they're gonna find me because they're gonna take those posters and send them to all the CVS. And eventually, something's gonna go. And, and I'm and I'm talking about. I hate to say this word to you. Am I talking about now or am I talking about six years ago before the podcast? Either one. When every once in a while somebody would say, that guy looks familiar. No. 
You follow me? I'm talking about before the longest yard and shit like that. They're going to get you in a month now with cameras. You basically can't do nothing. See, there's more cameras out there than what you know. Oh, yeah, like all the street lamps and all that stuff. So when you're walking down, you cross from the fucking train in North Hollywood Station, and you walk to all those fucking bars there on Lancashire. You have, like, one, two, and the bar on the corner of the Federal, where they shot the Sons of Anarchy across from that fucking place. Right there. Whatever you do there, whatever you do there is on tape on 18 different cameras, plus what's flying around you. Yeah, the drones and it's uh, I, there was this thing, and I it, it, I was just someone destroyed something the other day, but a drone caught them, like they they were they caught them destroying like this na- uh, natural formation, and it's it's ju- it's it's getting kind of like it, it's good that they caught that I guess, but it's getting kind of weird, like it's getting kind of scary to go outside now. No, it's not. You don't think so? No. It's scary depending where you go and what time you fucking go. I it, I, 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 just keep looking. I was thinking about you today. I First saw, of all, you leave the house. You're in a positive fucking state of mind. Okay? Right. Okay. You don't have to have a gun. No. You don't have to have none of that stuff. You leave your house. It's a beautiful day to be alive, even if you got $2 in your pocket because you're alive. Okay? You walk down the fucking street. You're walking, your chin's up, your chest is out, you're breathing. But the beautiful thing is you're not looking at your fucking phone, Lee. If you pay attention, America's a beautiful fucking thing. Now, let's say I take you and I go, Lee, I need a big favor. Take me down to Mexicanville to get heroin. And and I leave you in the car by yourself and you don't really know the game. You're going to get mugged. You put yourself in that position. Now, listen. Me and you could be going right now to Big Wings after this. Right. We walk over. We go across the street. The light's perfect. And a guy runs a red light and kills his boat. There's a percentage of that. There's a percentage that when we go to Big Wings to get wings, fucking Johnny Goomba is going to go in there and shoot a bunch of us because he, he, somebody fucked his girlfriend. Listen, man, you can't live like that. You can never live like that. I would never want somebody to live that way. Things could happen all the fucking time. Bad things could happen all the fucking time. And then the, 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 and in the weirdest fucking situations. Right. Yeah, and that's and that's the fucking scary part. Like but I, if you I, keep I, your head on top and you're not looking straight ahead and you're watching the cars coming and if you walk down the street and for some reason it's 82 degrees, but that guy's got a hooded sweatshirt on and there's a bump under his fucking shirt. Or, or you know, there's a lot of things you can't control. If there's an earthquake and a building falls on your head. You ain't fucking the Hulk. <laughs> you ain't holding up that fucking building. Right. But I, you, you can't. Listen, in my world, it scrambles through my world from time to time. What if I get on a fucking plane tomorrow and the plane crashes? What if I get on a plane Ali Bob and the 40 fucking thieves are on the fucking plane? What if I get on a fucking plane... And I, I, I thought there's a thousand possibilities in your life, but you got to live your life. You can't, this, listen, you know why I know this, Lee? Why? Because I told you once, and I told everybody on this, listen to this podcast, there was nobody that's more scared than I am of life. If I would be a millionaire, I would stay in my house all the time. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And you would know that, but it wouldn't be because of fear. It would be because, yeah, social fears. It would be because of a thousand fears. But it wouldn't be fear because the world might fucking end. You don't think I worry about my wife. You don't think I worry about my child. You don't think I worry about my friend Timmy driving a truck in New York all night. You don't think I worry about the Agostino driving on the 405 all fucking day. You don't think I worry about Tommy. He's still in the fucking van. I know, I know the realities that Tommy East and Tommy Easton knows the realities of living in a van. But you know, it's when Kate came in here eight, eight months ago and she was talking about moving in a van. Obviously, you don't know the realities of living in a fucking van. No. You know, listen, man. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things always happen to great people, and it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. You know, right now tonight I could leave here. 
Some guy comes up looking for fucking pussy and he shoots you in the fucking chest. No reason. No rhyme or reason. You had nothing to do with his fucking world. And you're gone. That could happen also. A lot of things happen like that. that but you always have to live your life. I, I do try to push it out. Like it's it's not I don't I, I I don't feel like it's something I dwell on all day, but I dwell on it at night. There's one one night every ten days that I lay down and a horrible thought comes to my mind about my family or my daughter or myself and I have to actually get up. The reason why I have to get up is because it's a reality. Fuck. I could pass it through my mind, but I can't digest it. So I just do what I was doing, smoke a number, watch TV for a while, and get the thought out of my head and say a prayer. Because I, listen, if you think at 15, 16, I thought my mom was going to die, you're fucking crazy. Right. You're fucking crazy. Who thinks they're going to get up in the middle of the night and find somebody on the floor, whether it's your mom, your uncle, your sister, your brother, who? Who in this right fucking world? Nobody. That's the last thing anybody ever thinks about. That's the last thing anybody thinks about. When you guys go to dinner and we crack jokes for an hour and we giggle and shit and, you know, we tell stories and then you get in your car and I go in my car and somebody else goes in their car and we say goodbyes and I'll see you tomorrow. What time? Leave 3 3.30. I'll see you tomorrow. When you get that call at 4 in the morning that he got hit by a drunk driver. But wait a second. This is a fucking dream. This is a fucking dream. That's the same way I felt. When Dominic Special died, that's the same way I felt when Anthony Balzano died. He just, I just saw him at 6 o'clock. What do you mean he went to Pathmark at 9 o'clock at night? I just saw him at 6. He was going home for dinner. He was going to study for a math testimony. You understand me? Things happen in life. That's what makes life live, is that things happen, people pass, and one day you have to learn how to live without them. Somebody passed in my life a couple of years ago. It's really weird the friends you gather and the relationships you have with them. And some of them pass, and, and you say a prayer for them, you send flowers, you go to the funeral, you think of them from time to time. I have a friend that passed maybe four or five years ago, maybe right before around Grudge Match. Right, yeah. Like I talked to him while I was shooting Grudge Match. And he was a dear friend of mine. He's the guy that took me out of fucking Jersey. He talked me into going to Colorado with him and buying a car and putting it under my name. Then he crashed it. And uh, it, it was just, uh, we hooked up in 83, and obviously we were friends till he passed three years ago. And it was a, a friendship that I talked to him once a week. You know, when I was back there, I don't meet with a lot of people. There would be one night a week in 93 where he would pick me up on Monday nights we'd drive down the shore together we'd go on his boat we'd go back to his house eat the fish we'd smoke pot we'd watch a movie and then we'd go to bed and we'd both he'd drive me back to New York City the next day at 4.45 in the morning I'd be by Madison Square Garden at fucking 5.30 a.m. walking around why so early? because that's when he, he was in charge of all the window washers in like six or seven buildings. Him and his brother worked at the World Trade Center for a while and they moved him around. But I spoke to him, you know, various times. When he came out here, he was in Huntington Park. And I actually scheduled a gig down there. It was like two days after my neck surgery with the fat ball. I actually scheduled a gig down there just so I could see him and he came with his brother. And I had a great time with him. And another time we went to fucking Atlantic City and on the way there, we were eating those contaminated crab legs with blood on them and shit. And we got a call from Linda Rowe to go to Connecticut and do a comedy gig. He drove me. And uh, just just shit like that, you know. And sure enough, a couple of years ago, he passed. And I got to tell you something. I still keep his number in my phone. I got his number in my phone, Nakafoli's number in my phone. I got like three people who punched the ticket in the last three or four years. I kept their fucking number just because that's the type of, type of psycho I am. They're not, they're just, I'm just having, their phone got disconnected for a few weeks. I'll bump into them someday. You know what I'm saying? I, I keep it that way. But Jimmy, I think about once a day. 
I'm craving. The reason why I've been thinking about him the last five days, he used to make this dish. Lee. You ready? Tell me. He gets spaghetti. He'd boil it. Good start. Boil it, boil it, boil it, boil it. Nice, nice. He had it perfect. While he was cooking the fucking spaghetti, he'd fry up some bacon. All right? And then he'd take the bacon off and he'd let it get really, really crispy. Really, really crispy, really, really crispy. Really, really crispy. And then he'd take the fucking spaghetti out and he'd put it in the strainer. And then when it was in the strainer, he'd throw a piece of fucking butter in that motherfucker. And he'd start right there working it with the butter and shit. Then he'd throw that right into the fucking thing. With and the bacon? Not yet. Then he'd throw the bacon on top of that, some more butter on top of that, and then he'd get an egg yolk and throw the egg yolk on top of that. And he'd mix it in real fucking good. And he'd throw some salt and pepper on that motherfucker. And Lee, it was delicious. Delicious. It sounds amazing. Delicious. Oh, but you got proteined up. If you were lifting weights, forget about it. He would cook a big pot of it once a week and just put it in the freezer, on the refrigerator, I'm sorry. And from time to time, you could take the pot out and just take a bowl, put it in the microwave oven, and bang, yeah, just sell some fucking pasta. The bacon bits were tremendous, how he made them. I could never make it that way. And I've been dying to make it for my daughter because it's something different. It's like a Puerto Rican fettuccine Alfredo. Right. Uh, but I don't think she'll eat it with the bacon in it. She doesn't like bacon? Ah, who the fuck knows? She eats bologna. And she calls it salami. I, you know, I don't. I don't. What are you gonna do with her? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. what am I gonna do with her? I got enough problems with you and shit like that. What am I gonna do? Uh, it's been fun going up on Tuesday nights. I've been enjoying it. Lee, that was the weirdest thing ever last night. People, let me explain something to you. You could do comedy when you first start out in comedy. You do what's called open mics, and there where you show up and you sign up, and there's a bunch of dickheads who think they're movie stars, and they get up and they do horrible material, and you wait there all night. You do comedy in front of other comedians, and it's hell. It really is hell. It really is a. It's like going to fucking die every time you go to those places because emotionally, you fucking die. It's been really. I don't know how comedians develop in open mics, because. Very rarely do you get any positive reinforcement. So I'm like, how do you know what is good? Because all you're learning how to do is becoming a wordsmith at that point. You're just going up there. You're just hitting numbers. Oh, and it, Open it, mics are numbers. I don't know what the magic number is for Lee Syatt. For Joe Diaz, it may be eight, 850 open mics. But for Lee Syatt, right now, where I see, maybe 200 open mics and you'll be feature acting. No. Yes. I don't think I want to be. No. No, 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 no. But it's good that you're doing it because now I can take you on the road and shit. I'll give see, you the small hundred. You do eight shows. That'd be fun. Sure, it'd be fun. You're not doing nothing else in your life, <laughs> I, I never thought this was anything because you know I, I. It's a story that everyone knows that I didn't want to talk on here. But now, like. I'm so now you're like fuck. Now I can't shut you the fuck up. Yeah, that's true. That's also now true. I gotta smack you twice to talk and eighteen times to shut up. You're like a crime relocation witness guy. <laughs> Lee, no, no, no. Let me tell you something. I love going to the comedy store and I love going to the Laugh Factory and I love going to the Improv. But I've been doing it for twenty years, guys. In January. And you go to a comedy club not to stay there. It depends how you use it, you know. The comedy store is a great club, but when I go in there, I go to work, bro. It's work. Ten years ago, it was a little bit more fun. When you're doing more rooms like last night? Then you have a thing called these open mics, which people who have been doing comedy over ten years, they don't go to them. You, your pride just says, I'm not going to them no more. I've always known that that's the heart of comedy. I always know that when I need to improve or I need to uh, be thankful for what I've done and what I have, I have to go to open mics. And years ago, it would be those Mexican rooms because it's very weird to go on stage at the comedy store when you first get here and have Gary Shandling bring you up and then you're bringing up dice. 
at the same time, that same night, I was bringing up a Mexican <laughs> dude with a limp and another one that stutters down in some cougar room in fucking Pomona. Do you follow me? And so that must fuck with your head. It didn't fuck with my head. It doesn't? It, it made me a better comedian. balanced me out. It showed me that comedy was comedy. It doesn't matter who the fuck you're on stage with. You got to work the same fucking way, whether Jesus Dice is there or fucking Dave Chappelle is there or some open mic kid from fucking Redlands. It really doesn't fucking matter. That's what that taught me. So for years, I would go to clubs that Willie ran, Philly Bass Bars ran, and you'd get stabbed at. All right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I ended up at the comedy store. I knew the other spot. So no matter how bad it was in that room, you follow where I was working at? I was working both sides of the fucking fence just to balance my head out right so it wouldn't overwhelm me. That's a smart way to do it. I had to, Lee. I had to. So, like, do you think if people, like, just start going to the store and get passed right away? Like, you got passed right away. Okay. And if you were just doing amazing spots, do you think... I got passed at the comedy store the same way I got my blue belt. Okay. I was a hard worker. I put together a set. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time. It took me six years of my life to get into work hard, to get into the comedy store. And I'm not going to lie to nobody. The first two years, I was dicking off. I was dicking off. So for four years, I gave up everything. I lived in an office. I went to fucking jail for, for, for arguing with some chick's boyfriend and getting arrested for domestic violence. I lived on scraps. Josh Wolf helped me out. I mean, it was a nightmare. I lived in a basement with a fucking bed and a bench for dinner. It was completely of who the fuck I was. It was completely out of my comfort zone. But the whole time, I was fucking evolving, and I wasn't even knowing it. I wasn't even knowing it. I was shedding that skin, and I wasn't even knowing it. I wasn't even fucking knowing it. So it took me basically six years. I was to that point. Now, was I a good comic to be at the store? No. I've seen better comics. I got into the store. But she liked characters. Mm -hmm.